the pre-tribulation rapture judgment. That's what today's message is going to be called. It's been a little while since I did a, a study on the rapture, and this pre-tribulation rapture doctrine is continually being attacked, so I feel it's important to continually defend it. Now, I'm going to be showing you some other arguments here from the Bible, uh, not from traditions of men or uh, John Nelson Darby or C.I. Schofield. I'm going to be using the King James Bible. You see, the truth is I don't really care who taught what or when something was taught or whatever. That's irrelevant. That's not really even an argument. The standard for a Christian is, what does the Bible say? You're to be like the Bereans in the book of Acts, to search the scriptures daily whether these things are so. Okay, If, if what I'm saying here is heretical and false, then the scriptures that I'm going to be giving you today uh, won't line up, and you can read the scriptures and see I'm misquoting them or whatever. Uh, of course, that's not going to be the case. I am going to show you what the Bible says, and uh, you will see that the Bible very clearly teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, one of the common attacks against the pre-tribulation rapture is that it is some sort of escapism belief. It's held by Laodicean kind of sissy Christians that are afraid of any kind of persecution. Uh, that's not at all true, of course. Uh, the fact is, pre-tribulation rapture is not about man getting away from, or Christians getting away from, from the wrath of man. It's about Christians getting out of this world before God's wrath is poured out. See, the tribulation time period, better known as the time of Jacob's trouble, it's the Lord who brings that thing to pass. Now, there's never been any time in the Bible where the Lord has poured out wrath, his wrath on just people. Every time you see God's judgment with Noah and the flood, he spared Noah and his three sons and their wives, and, of course, Mrs. Noah. Lot is taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah with his two daughters before God's wrath is poured out. And, of course, his wife came out too, but she looked back and turn to a pillar of salt. But then you go through the history of Israel, and every time God's judgment is going to be poured out, he always removes the just, those that are upset by what's going on in, in Jerusalem. God never pours out his wrath on people that are doing right. Why? Because God's a just God. And people say, well, the church is in apostasy. No, that's not true. There are elements within professing Christianity that are in apostasy. But you cannot blanket statements say that all Christians out there are apostate. Uh, I'm not apostate. Okay, and a lot of the, a lot of you my listeners, you're not apostate either. You're doing uh right, you're reading the right Bible, you're living according to the scriptures. You know, you can't just say every Christian out there is apostate. That's not true. So this judgment that's coming, this pre-tribulation rapture it is just that. It is a judgment. And I'm going to show you about that today. Now, I'm going to start out here in Mar Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. It says here, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, Matthew chapter 13 is not primarily aimed at pre-tribulation, at the pre-tribulation rapture, at the church age. Okay, Matthew chapter 13 is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you've heard from other studies, the kingdom of heaven is the physical, literal kingdom that will be here for a thousand years with Jesus Christ ruling from Jerusalem. And we've done other studies on that. It is not heaven where God is. All right, there's the verse there in Matthew, I think it's chapter 11, that talks about the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Well, nobody's going to take heaven by force. All right, And heaven is not suffering violence. No, what it's talking about is it's talking about the, the physical kingdom here on the earth, the throne of David that God promised to give Jesus as an inheritance. He came as the king of the Jews the first time, Israel... The Jewish people rejected him as their king, so the kingdom was put off for approximately 2,000 years. Right, that's what's going on here. 
but I'm going to use this parable to show you a basic concept of Scripture. So let's continue here. Matthew chapter 13, verses 25 through 30. We'll read that here. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now I just want to say here very quickly an interesting study, uh, wheat versus tares. I uh, have a, here a picture, and you can find this by going online and typing in wheat versus tares. There's a picture of a man holding a, a head of wheat, the wheat stalk, and then a tear in his other hand. And it says here, the caption, there was actually a, a blog, a Christian website there that, that had this picture, and then they were talking about it. And I copied it here. It's very interesting. It says, as you can see from this picture, there is a marked difference. The tear on the left is light and lacks substance, but the wheat on the right is heavy and bears fruit, like the grain. There are tiny black seeds inside the tares, and if you eat it, it can cause dizziness and nausea. Also notice that the tear stands straight up and proud, while the wheat bows from the weight of the fruit in humility. Talk about the perfect physical and spiritual contrast between the wheat and the tear. One gives life, the other kills. Those in Christ have life, and the other, death. It's very true. Jesus Christ used this, this symbology of a tear versus wheat. Now, it's interesting because they do look very similar. And a lot of times when they're young and immature, a young wheat stalk will look very similar to a tear. But as the, as the wheat stalk matures, just like a Christian, the older you get as a Christian, you start to distance yourself from the lost world. And you'll see a, a, a fake professing Christian. It's very hard to tell when somebody just first gets saved. Babies in Christ, new Christians, a lot of times will do some stupid things. I mean, they'll, they'll do some sins and you kind of look and you go, boy, I don't know if they really got saved. Well, you know, that'll come and be manifest as time goes on. But uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, you say, well, I don't know. I think that, you know, you just have real Christians or, or, you know, mature Christians and carnal Christians. I don't know about this thing of false brethren. Well, let's look at that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, Paul writing here, he says, In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, the Jews, in other words, in perils by the heathen, the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Now, do you think if Paul had claimed that there are false brethren in the first century, do you think there might be a few today? Uh, yeah. You know, when the Bible says that we are in the last days and that there would be a falling away, yeah, I'd say that there's probably a few false brethren out there. Definitely. But what is this harvest? What's this harvest talking about? Well, this is an interesting subject. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to start at verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So you have there mentioned basically the harvest, the first resurrection, as we're going to see a little bit later. The first resurrection has basically three parts to it. Okay, And if you know anything at all about gardening or farming or anything like that where you have a crop that grows... 
you know that they basically have three parts. Right? You have your first fruits. You go out there to the garden and you look and, hey, you know, that the bean plant, there's a couple young immature beans on it. Oh, well, look at that. Then after that, you have the harvest, where a lot of times, depending on the, the weather that year and, and everything else, a lot of times you'll have to go out and pick two times a day, sometimes more. I know my younger sister and her husband, they had a, they grew beans, I think it was last year, and they were, I mean, they just had baskets of them, you know, from just a few plants. Lots and lots of harvest. And then what happens after the harvest is over? Well, after that, you have the gleanings. You go out, no, okay, there's one, and there's one over there, and uh, that plant looks like it's drying up. Oh, it, okay, it still has one bean on it. So at the beginning of that time frame, you have a couple, which is the first fruits, then you have the big harvest, and then at the end you have a few gleanings. That's how it is with any crop. And that's how it's going to be with the resurrection. Uh, now, if you notice there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, what's that talking about? Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 53 says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. You see there are the first fruits of them that slept. Uh, it's another big study, but in the Old Testament, they couldn't go directly to heaven. They had to go to Abraham's bosom, which was down in the earth. It was a, right actually across from hell. You have the rich man in hell, and he looks over and he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Now, that's not there anymore. You know, the Catholics try to say it is. They try to make that into purgatory. Uh, they weren't burning over there in Abraham's bosom. They were sleeping. That's no longer there. But you say, well, then, then this happened right when Jesus died on the cross? No. Let's continue reading here. Matthew 27, verse 52 and 53. I'll read 52 again. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, comma, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So you have there, after the resurrection of Jesus, after he came up from the dead, I believe when he died on the cross, they put him in the grave, and he went down, his soul went down to that area, that was called hell many times in the Old Testament. And he went down there and he preached to the people, the saints, which slept. And then he took them up with him to heaven. Those Old Testament saints that made it to Abraham's bosom. And again, that's a whole other study. But what you have there, you have that first fruits, the first part of the resurrection. Now what happens next? Well, you have the harvest. And the harvest has a couple parts to it. Obviously, you don't go out in one day and have one big harvest. All right, it's going to take you a little bit. Now, the first part of the harvest, we'll say day one, so to speak, the first part of that harvest is going to be the church age saints. Now, when does that happen? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, I'm going to read down through a couple of verses here. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, if you've heard the other pre-tribulation rapture studies, you know that Paul is revealing something here for the first time. That's why it's called a mystery. Paul's not re referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Continuing here, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed." For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right, you have dead saints there being caught up first. The dead Christians, the dead in Christ, as we're going to read here in a minute. And then they are followed immediately by the living Christians. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. 
says here, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, when you die as a Christian, your soul does go to heaven. You are able to go into the presence of the Lord. Paul wrote about it. He said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So you have Christians, their soul is in heaven. But Paul wrote about when he went up there, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. And why? Well, because as a soul, he could sense that he was in heaven and, you know, he kind of looked down and he probably didn't see too much of anything. Why? Well, because his body was still down here on the earth. I'm sure his body is pretty much rotted by now, but if you would go, say, to the graveyard there where someone like D.L. Moody, you know, definitely a saved man, died back in 1899, and you would go there and you'd exhume his body, well, there'd probably be some remnants of it left, probably just a skeleton or, or whatever. But my point is, your body does not go to heaven yet. So in a sense, your body is still sleeping. Now, in the Old Testament, it was body and soul and spirit. They were all totally down there in Abraham's bosom. And as I said, we don't go to Abraham's bosom now, but our bodies are, in a sense, sleeping until they join the soul at the rapture. But continuing here, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, I'll start over and read it here again. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I need to make a very important distinction here. The parable of the wheat and the tares, I use that solely for instruction in righteousness. Okay, That is not doctrinally about the rapture. It's about the second coming, the end of the tribulation there, the judgment of the nations. We're going to get into that as we continue here. But I need to make that distinction because I had a, a guy write to me and he said he compared that parable of the wheat and the tares with here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And he's saying it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. And he was saying that, see, the tares are collected first and they're, they're put into hell. So it's the wicked being taken to judgment. And he said, see, that's what's going on here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I wrote back and I said, no, it isn't. Just read the context. You know, there was a guy, John Weaver, that's been teaching this thing of the rapture of the wicked. And it's one of the most absurd things I've ever heard. All you got to do is read the context of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Verse 16 says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And they say, well, that's the wicked being taken to judgment. Um, are the wicked the dead in Christ? <laughs> no. No wicked person is in Christ. You know who is in Christ? Christians. All right? There's no rapture of the wicked in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's absurd to teach that. Absolutely absurd. You have the rapture. We're going to say more about this as, as we continue here. But now harvest day number two, the second part of this big harvest of souls that the Lord is going to be removing from the earth. Harvest day cha or, uh, number two here. Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. You know, 9, 11, 9, 1, 1. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season unto their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Now it's interesting there, something very interesting. In verse 9 it says that they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, how could they be slain for the word of God if the word of God passed away with the original autographs? 
No, this is a yet-to-happen future event. These are not first century Christians or something. All right, they, These are people that die in that tribulation time period. This is one of the seals that's open. And it's open after the Antichrist is unleashed. Un, unleashed, excuse me. So you have a future group of people who are being slain for the word of God. Now I'm going to give you my theory on that a little bit later. But it says there that they are to stay there, these souls until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Very interesting. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. We'll go through here and see when this event is going to happen. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. When you have the church age ending at the rapture and the tribulation beginning, you now have a faith plus works set up. That's not heresy, it's Bible doctrine. Right now, there's nothing that you can do to lose your salvation as a Christian. As a Christian. You know, if you are lost, you don't have salvation. But once you truly get saved, you are sealed into the day of redemption. Again, we'll be talking about that here in just a little bit. In that tribulation time period, if you miss the rapture and you end up getting saved afterwards and you're convinced, if you take the mark of the beast... Taking the mark is also going to include worshiping the beast, and so you will be damned to hell at that point. This thing of, well, you can take the mark and still be a saved person there in the tribulation, nope, not true. So there's a, an element of works involved there. You can't take the mark of the beast. That's why you know that the church age is going to end at the pre-tribulation rapture. But continuing here, Revelation 14, verse 13 through 16 and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his, in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe, and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, I believe probably here, and I've been back and forth on this a little bit, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get everything figured out about a future dispensation. All right, the dispensation that's been given to me as a, as a preacher is the church age. The church age is the dispensation I'm supposed to know and preach, and some of the stuff that's going to happen there in the time of Jacob's trouble, the Great Tribulation, as many call it, some of the things that are going to happen there are going to totally change this earth. It's going to be a totally different thing. And so I can't be 100% dogmatic on a lot of this stuff, but I do believe that there is a rapture, a partial rapture there in Revelation chapter 14, that gathering together there. We'll continue here. And then, of course, next, after that, after these tribulation saints are, are taken up, uh, Revelation 14, verse 17, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Uh, God is quite angry with the wicked. Revelation chapter 15 verses 1 through 3. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, notice that, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now, I believe there is a picture of saved Jews singing the song of Moses and saved Gentiles the song of the Lamb. It's kind of an interesting thing there. 
Revelation 15, verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after this I looked... After that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth for ever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Revelation 16, verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. I'm glad I'm not going to be here for that. Definitely not. Now, the next harvest, the next part of the harvest here, the millennial kingdom candidates, we'll call that. In other words, the people that have made it the whole way through, for some reason or another, they they were not... They didn't go up at the pre-tribulation rapture. They didn't go up at that partial rapture there of tribulation saints that we see in Revelation 14, continuing into 15. They are the ones who make it the whole way through. They endure to the end. These are the ones that show up at the judgment of the nations, which you can read about in Matthew chapter 25. We're going to start at verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Now you remember what we read earlier there, the parable of the wheat and tares, the parable of the kingdom of heaven. This is where it's being fulfilled in Matthew chapter 25. You have Jesus Christ separating the sheep and the goats, just like he separates the wheat from the tares. The weed, of course, being the type of the sheep. The tear being the type of the goat. Continuing, verse 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee, sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is pre- prepared for the devil and his angels, not bad people. <laughs> All right, if you go to, to hell, it's your own fault, uh, because you rejected Jesus Christ. Verse 42, For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal." So, there we have the uh, judgment there, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the separating of the two. Notice it's totally different. All right? But I want you to notice something. There are no dead saints at the judgment of the nations. Did you see any resurrection of the dead there? When Jesus Christ comes back that second time, when he comes back to rule and reign here on the earth, when there's a when he brings all these people before him, there's no resurrection mentioned. None. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, 
neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now what's going on there? Well, you have at the second coming, part of those who come back are those who died in that first part of the time of Jacob's trouble. And then they were gathered up to be with the Lord in heaven, Revelation chapter 14 through chapter 15. And they come back for the millennial inheritance. Now here you have the last part of that first resurrection. Okay, the, the harvest that starts with the first fruits, then the harvest, then the gleanings. Here you have the gleanings, you have the dead tribulation saints and millennial saints. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 and 6 says here, But the rest of the dead, the rest of the dead, the people that died after that first, the you have the pre-tribulation rapture, then you have that middle rapture, and then now the rest of the dead, those that died after that, lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, I actually had a guy the one time say, that see the rapture can't be pre-tribulation because the first resurrection isn't over till the millennium. And I thought, I'm sorry, but that's one of the dumbest arguments I've ever heard. All right, there was a resurrection back when Jesus came up from the dead that was called the first fruits. Many of the saints which slept arose. That means a resurrection. I know that's kind of hard to understand, you know, but I mean, you, you'll get it eventually. No, the first resurrection has many parts to it. Right, the first resurrection is what happens before eternity comes. But let's continue here. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. If you're not saved and you're saying, I need to wait, I want to see proof of this rapture thing, that's real dangerous. If you make it past the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, and then you go and, and you don't make it into the the rapture there of the tribulation saints, and you end up at the end, and you get killed before Jesus Christ comes back a second time, uh, you're not going to be living during the, you know, you'll be sleeping basically uh, as a dead person. You won't be resurrected until the end of the millennium. But let's continue here. Uh, next, I want to talk about the redemption of the purchased possession. Another proof of the rapture, pre-tribulation rapture. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 10 through 14 says here that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now remember what we read earlier there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well then what are they doing? Where are they at right now? Well their souls are in heaven. If you die before the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, you will go to heaven and there you will meet the souls of the saints. They are the ones who are in heaven. And right now, if you are a living Christian here on the earth, then you are the ones that are listed there, the second group, and which are on earth. And then it says, even in him. You see, we are in Christ Jesus. If you are saved, if you are a Christian, you are part of his body. Now, again, just take the simple understanding of Scripture here. How could God pour out wrath on the body of Christ? It would be like attacking himself. So it doesn't work. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What's the purchased possession? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God purchased you with his own blood. 
not his death, right? as John MacArthur says. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God owns you. Right? That's the simple truth of it. He will not pour out wrath on his own children. I'm real sorry if you're a post-tribber out there and you just want to, you just, oh man, I want to have God's wrath poured out on me to prove how tough I am. You know, I've seen some of these post-trib people and they'll, they'll say, well, actually, I think that some of the pre-tribbers are, are making the events of Revelation look worse than they will be. You know, they're actually not going to be that bad. Oh, come on. A third of the world's population dying, all the oceans and the rivers and everything else turning to blood. Oh, it's not that bad. Give me a break. Yes, it will be very bad. Just incredible. But I want to tell you a quick little story here to kind of illustrate this point about the purchased possession. Back, back last year, March of 2011, uh, I had been in the market for a motorcycle, a cheap motorcycle. Don't get excited. You know, I'm not living high on the hog here or anything. I mean, you know, the hog being like a Harley. <laughs> they call them hogs, but whatever. Anyhow, you know, I, I just wanted a cheaper motorcycle just to be able to ride around, save on gas money. I I was riding motorcycles six, year, six years before I ever drove a car. If you've heard my testimony, you, you know I was very much into motorcycles. But I'd saved up some money and I wanted to buy a bike. And I was on eBay and I saw the bike I wanted and, I, and it was the right price and everything. I bid on it and I won it. There was just one problem. The bike was in another state. It was actually in West Virginia. Now I paid for the motorcycle and I, and basically I, I couldn't go down right away. It was going to be like, a, I think it was right around two weeks. And so I called the guys and I said, you know, I'm not going to be able to come down right away. They had stipulations that you had to pick it up within like three days or something. And I said, there's just no way I can. Is, our, is it all right if you keep it down there for me? And they said, yeah, sure, no problem. They said, we're going to put a, a tag on it that says sold. It's going to be out in the showroom floor with all the other motorcycles, but it's going to have a tag on it that says sold. And we have the paperwork here that has your name as owning that motorcycle. Now, in like manner, as a Christian, I am God's purchased possession. And if you're saved, you are God's purchased possession as well. We're down here in the showroom, so to speak, but you see we're sealed until the day of redemption. Just like my motorcycle was sealed until the day of redemption. It didn't matter if anybody came in there and they said, hey, I want that bike over there. Sorry, it's got a guy's name on it. it over there, you look at the tag and it says Brian Denlinger. This motorcycle belongs to Brian Denlinger. It's going to wait here until he comes to pick it up. Now that's how it is with us as Christians. We are here, we are sealed with God's Holy Spirit of promise, until the day that he says, all right, redemption of the purchased possession, my son, my daughter, come on home. You belong to me. I've been waiting for this day for a long time. I'll tell you, I was, I was excited when I went down there to pick up that motorcycle. Yeah, it was one of the greatest days I've had in a long time. You know, it's going to be an exciting thing for the Lord to come down and redeem his purchased possession. But again, if you believe in this post-tribulation rapture thing, what kind of a God are you worshiping anyhow? This God's up there and he, and he looks down and he goes, you Christians down there that are doing right and living right, I'm just going to pour out my fury and my wrath on you. What a warped way of thinking. I'm sorry, but I'll just, I will separate over the issue. You know, some people say, oh, it's not a major doctrinal issue, whether the timing of the rapture. Oh, it most definitely is. And we've had people that want to come here and be part of this Bible Believers Fellowship, our little church here, and they say, but I do differ on the rapture issue. Well, then don't come. I'm not going to allow anybody into this church that's post-trib in their beliefs because it affects so much doctrine. It just messes you all up. Just incredible. We are God's purchased possession. And we are sealed until the day that he comes and redeems us. And it's not too far off. That's why I'm, one of the reasons I'm doing this 
message here. Now, continuing, we're going to look here. I'm going to show you this thing of, of what happens. Another interesting point here. Let's look at Paul as an example. Before he got saved, he was called Saul. Uh, many of you know that, but for those of you who don't, that's what was going on. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Stephen was killed in Acts chapter 7, and Saul was there for it. And it starts out here, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So you see it there, Saul, before he was called Paul, he was going out and attacking the church. And the church, by the way, is a reference to the people, not to a building. Because it says he made havoc of the church, entering into every house. The early believers met in houses. Continuing here, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Now he's going, well, I'll read here. It explains it. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Any of this way there meant Christians. Verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And of course you can read the rest of the story there. He ends up getting saved, and he obviously goes on to do some miraculous things for the Lord. But did let me just ask you a question here. When did Saul ever actually persecute Jesus Christ physically? Did he ever go up to him, and did you ever read in the Gospels where this man named Saul went up and hit Jesus? No. Who was Saul persecuting? He was persecuting Christians. He was killing Christians, putting them in prison. And Jesus said, "Why, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my Christians, my followers? Did he say that? No. He said, why persecutest thou me? Now you need to get a hold of that. You see, when somebody attacks a Christian, a true born-again, Bible-believing Christian, when somebody attacks them, they're actually attacking Jesus Christ. doesn't mean that I'm Christ or that Christians are Christ, but we are part of his body. Now again, God looks down on this earth and he says, I spared Noah because he was a righteous man. I spared Lot because he was a righteous man. I spared the righteous Jews different times there and during Exodus and everything where they would... They were following the Lord and the others he'd wipe out or whatever. I spared those, but my own body, the body of Christ, I'm not going to spare them from my wrath. See, that whole system is just ridiculous. I mean, I just, I cannot give somebody respect who believes in the post-tribulation rapture, who believes that the body of Christ is going to go through God's wrath. I'm sorry, I'm going to be real blunt here. It's a stupid system of belief. Now, what is stopping the Antichrist from showing up? Another good question. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. What's that? Well, we just read about it. The redemption of the purchased possession. Verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, what is the day of Christ? Why were they troubled about this? People were saying that the day of Christ is at hand. Well, what's going on here? Well, some say that it is a 
it's a, rap, a reference to the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. And certainly if you look at Philippians chapter 1 verses 6 and 10 and chapter 2 verse 16, it does definitely appear that the day of Christ, and it's called the day of Christ there, it appears that it's a reference to the rapture and the judgment seat. And that's where most people leave it. I don't, however. Uh, basically because, you know, the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ, I mean, why would you be shaken or troubled by that? But uh, the day of the Lord, you know, you have the day of Christ and you also have the day of the Lord, that reference is is meaning Christ's second coming. And there's a lot of scriptures on that. I mean, there's a whole lot. I can't list them all here, but some in the Old Testament, you have Joel chapter 1, verse 15, chapter 2, verse 1, verse 11 and 31, chapter 3, verse 14, Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, and a whole lot of other places in the Minor Prophets. Also, it's listed the day of the Lord is, is mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 8, chapter 5, verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, and a very interesting one in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, which I, ju I just read here just a few minutes ago, said about the day of Christ is at hand. And uh, let me read here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now look at this, verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Now what was Paul referring to there? He was referring to the first letter. When I was yet with you, I told you these things? Don't you remember what I told you before? Is what Paul is saying. Now did Paul mention the day of Christ in the first letter to the Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Hmm. So he was, when he says the day of Christ there, he's referring back to what he originally said, which was the day of the Lord. So I believe this reference in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 to the day of Christ is a reference back to 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verse 2, which says the day of the Lord. I think it's a reference to the second coming, not to the rapture. And you're going to see why I say that as we continue. Uh, but I'm going to read a couple more verses here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. It says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Now, I believe, as I said, that that day of the Lord is what Paul later refers to as the day of Christ. I believe it's a reference to the second coming. And like I said, you're going to see here why I say that as we continue. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, lists two things that will happen before the second coming. In other words, they were they were all shook up and troubled thinking that the second coming was was approaching and that they had missed the rapture, right? Which, you know, if you're one of these post-trib believers, you really do need to live in fear because you're looking for the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and all this stuff, and you're going to have to endure to the end to be saved. So it is a very fearful thing. I'm not looking for that stuff. Okay, I can see it being formed. Sure, absolutely. But I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm looking for... I'm like that motorcycle in the showroom. I have that tag on me that says sold. And on the name there, the name tag, it says Jesus Christ. He's the owner of me. And he's going to be coming soon to redeem me. That's what I'm living like. That's how I live. All right, I'm not living to see the Antichrist. Now the two signs there, the falling away. Well, we're in it right now. And it's kind of an interesting thing. The purpose of the falling away, why things have fallen apart here in America, is actually listed back in Amos chapter 11, or chapter 8, verse 11 through 12. It says here, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, 
and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. The number one email that I get is, where can I go to church? I've gone to all the churches in the area here. None of them preach the King James Bible, and those that do are lukewarm Laodicean. You know, where on earth am I supposed to go to church? Well, we have the fulfillment of Amos chapter 8. You say, wait a second there. It said that God sent this famine. Yeah, he did. You don't want to know why? Because God will oftentimes give people exactly what they want. People said, I don't want that old King James Bible, that old archaic thing. I want the newer, updated West Cotton Hort. Oh, we want the newer American Standard Version. Oh, we want the Revised Standard Version. Well, we want the new American Standard Version. Oh, now we want the new King James, the new International Version, the new Living Translation, the new Revised Standard Version. See? And so God says, okay, go ahead. You can have that. But for those faithful few down there that are going to stick by God's Word, the King James Bible for English-speaking Christians, I'll bless you and I'll use you. But these new version people, there's all kinds of confusion. Why? They don't have any standards. So I've been over this time and time again. They don't have the standards that a King James Bible believer does. I mean, how could you teach a classroom where everybody had different textbooks that contradicted one another? You know, How can you have unity in a church when people all have different Bibles that say different things? See, it's a, it's a real serious problem. Now, will Christians see the Antichrist being revealed? Remember, it said the two signs, the falling away and that man of sin be revealed. Will Christians see it? No, they won't. I'm going to show you why. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now these verses were covered in much greater detail in my expository study of Second Thessalonians. I did all three chapters. But uh, the body slash bride of Christ is what is hindering the Antichrist from showing up. Okay, that spirit of Antichrist is there. He that denieth the Father and, and the Son and things... If you read back there in 1 John, that spirit is already here. But the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, he is going to show up after the body of Christ is removed. And again, I've covered that in other studies. You see this large group of redeemed saints. There are the 24 elders, and then there's many angels, which is what I believe Christians will become eventually. The, we are, you know, now ye are the sons of God. Sons of God's a reference to the angels in the Old Testament. Those that fell, we replace them. Again, this has all been covered in greater detail in other studies. I hate to even mention it here because it takes a lot of scripture to show all this stuff. I'm just kind of hitting the surface. But we are redeemed. We are there, bought out of every nation, tongue, kindred. You see that in Revelation chapter 5. We're bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a huge group. Of You have the 24 elders, plus you have the angels. They're there. They're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They're not Old Testament Jews, because they're, they're from every kindred and tongue and nation. And they're there, and in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, and down through there, it reveals the Antichrist. The first seal is open, and the Antichrist is unleashed. So, we're definitely there before the Antichrist shows up. Now, uh, and as I stated earlier, God can't judge this world until we, his children, are removed. But now look what happens after we leave and the Antichrist shows up. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The fact of the matter is that the, these wicked modern professing Christians that hate the truth, and you'll run into them if you're saved, they're going to be sent a strong delusion from God 
so that they will believe a lie and that they'll all be damned. They'll go to hell. Now, see, that God that would do a thing like that is very foreign to a lot of people today. They think God's some lovey big teddy bear up in the heavens that just wants all the best for you. Well, he wants the best for you, but he has some rules that you are to abide by. And, you know, one of them, which is our one of our main verses at Bible Believers Fellowship, it's on the front of our pulpit, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17, 17. If you don't submit to this book, this King James Bible, if you speak English, you don't submit to this book, you're not living right. You're not right with God. You might be saved, maybe, I don't know, but you're not living right. Now we're going to... St this strong delusion. What is this strong delusion that's going to be so strong that people will believe it and go to hell? What is that? We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So, now what will happen at the rapture? Well, here again, another detailed study, and I can't hit all the, get into everything, but I believe the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 through 3 represent a lot of different things, and one of the things is seven types of Christians. Okay, you have seven, you could say seven literal churches in Asia Minor, seven church periods in church history, seven types of, of churches, seven types of Christians. You know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So you can use scripture to instruct people in righteousness and also to reprove and correct. But the two churches that I want to focus on are the two last churches mentioned, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Now, I believe Philadelphia represents Bible-believing Christianity. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word. The only church of the seven that kept the word of God. And hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Jew in, the, in your Bible is primarily a reference to a racial group not spiritual Jews, right? Most of your references to Jews in your Bible are references to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and going far enough back, Shem. A lot of Christians, most Christians, the white Europeans, Europeans are descendants of Japheth, and the African uh, descendants are descendants of Ham. We are not of Shem. So don't go around acting like you're a Jew when you're not. Verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. <coughs> now the next group, the Laodicean type. Here you have the carnal apostate modern Christian, professing Christian many times. They're, they're like the tares. You know, if you want to see wheat and tares in terms of a Christian application, spiritual application here, the wheat would be the Philadelphian. The tare would be the Laodicean. Revelation 3, verse 14 through 22. And under the angel of the church of the, La of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. 
and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The fact is, modern Christians make God sick. Very few of them are really saved. You see these big, mega, huge churches, and people are there to be entertained, and, and their ears to be tickled. You know, most of them are lost. Now, it could be that there's one in there that is totally green. They just got saved. You know, they're... They're green as in a novice, you know, just brand new young baby Christian. They really don't know any better yet about the rapture. If they're really truly saved, they're going to be leaving. If not, well, you know, obviously they'll be staying. But I think that there could be some of those. Some of those modern Christians, the ones that are just real young in the Lord, well, I can't really tell one way or the other but I can definitely show you people that I know are saved. I know their testimony. I know their life. I see what they're doing with their life. They have a tremendous amount of works that prove their salvation. You say, wait a second, we're not saved by works. We're not saved by works. You know, you hear that thing. Well, we're not. That's correct. But works do prove your salvation. Titus chapter 1 verse 16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, reprobate. It doesn't say they don't do good works. It just says that their good works are reprobate. You know, and a lot of these modern Christians, they'll put on all kinds of good works and, and nice little social issues, but they're actually not really doing anything for the Lord. Okay, they wouldn't offend anybody, you know, for Jesus Christ's sake, if their life depended on it. They just wouldn't do it. Now, will God spew them out of his mouth? Well, let me just give you another little analogy here when you eat food only a small part of that food actually makes it into the bloodstream and then into the body most food is foreign matter okay the bible there again jesus talked about it goes into the mouth and is cast out into the draught all right figure out what that means uh, modern christians are going to be spewed out of christ's body at the rapture all right that's what i believe I believe when the rapture actually hits, you're going to see this judgment. This judgment where God says, okay, first part of the harvest, the real, true, saved, Bible-believing Christian, that wheat, that's going to be gone, and I'm going to take it up. I'm going to redeem my purchased possession. I'm going to take it up to heaven to be with me, caught up together with the dead saints in Christ that rise first, and then we which are alive are called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, that's going to happen. And those carnal, Laodicean-type modern Christians that are actually end up hating the truth uh, and that don't like to be, you know, judged, you know, and all that stuff, they're going to be here. They're not going to be leaving. So you see, it's not the rapture, the pre-trib rapture is not some kind of a little sissy teaching that, oh, you know, you guys are just doing it, it's just escapism or something. No, it's actually going to be a very horrible thing. And I'm going to, next here, I'm going to actually do just a little, kind of an interesting way to present my theory of the rapture. And it's just a theory, I'm not setting a date here, but I'm just going to give you an interesting theory to kind of illustrate what I believe is going to happen when you know, immediately after, immediately following the rapture. So this is going to be just kind of a little dramatization here. And I think that this is going to accurately represent what's going to come. So here we go. The year is 2012. Many people have been led to believe that the world is going to end this year because of the Mayan calendar and popular Hollywood movies. Harold Camping's failed false rapture prophecy of 2011 has led many to doubt the rapture. People are distracted with the economy, war with Iran, and the upcoming presidential campaign here in America. Suddenly, there's a huge 
huge sound like a hundred claps of thunder. People blink their eyes in reaction to the sound. When they open their eyes a second later, they notice chaos has taken over. Within minutes, sirens are sounding and people are screaming. They point to what look like small piles of remains where some poor person seems to have been disintegrated by some sort of explosion. Who did this? And why? Down the street, a woman screams that her small baby has been the victim of this terrible attack. You run inside to turn on the news and are shocked to see that they are reports from all over the globe of this same series of events. Experts from every field are consulted to try and make sense of this confusing situation. Slowly a pattern starts to surface. The identities of the victims begin to emerge, and they all have one thing in common. They all seem to be part of radical, fundamentalist, Bible-believing churches. Apparently their dissatisfaction with the world has caused them to plot a mass suicide bombing and claim it was the rapture. The heads of all the churches are consulted, and the world's most prominent leaders in Christendom make public apologies for the behavior of these cult members. The Pope angrily criticizes their actions and uses the chance to promote the Catholic Church, which has an ordained priesthood to rightly explain the sacred scriptures so as to avoid these types of dangerous fringe movements. The Pope is joined by leaders like Rick Warren and Joel Osteen, who cry over the fact that some of their very own church members have relatives who were involved in this horrible cult. Many even tried to talk them out of their strange beliefs, but now it is too late for them. The governments of the world join with the religions to publicly denounce this incident as the worst act of terrorism ever in history. The King James Bible is seen as the textbook for this radical terrorist fringe group, and so they are gathered up and publicly burned. This horrible book, which has caused so much division, becomes illegal and owning one will be punished with prison time. Suddenly, the news reports break into the regular programming. It appears as though the Vatican has a special announcement to be made. As the cameras focus in on the front of St. Peter's Basilica, the Pope walks out followed by a man who appears to be Jesus Christ. The Pope walks out in front of all the other Catholic hierarchy, and in unison they all turn and bow before the returned Savior of the world. After what seems like an eternity of silence, Christ speaks in a deep, soft voice. Peace be unto thee. I have come back to unite this world in this great time of conflict. Let us all join hands and enter into a new world of peace and love. Let us respect one another and no longer hate our enemies. Now guess what's going to happen if that little scenario comes true? The whole world's going to follow that Antichrist, they're going to worship him, and they're going to be damned. I shouldn't say the whole world, most of the world will follow him and be damned. Think about it. Does anybody really know what Jesus Christ looked like? You say, well, we have a lot of paintings. They're artist renditions. Hey, here's a theory for you. What if the artists have been painting the Antichrist for 2,000 years? What if their man that they have, the guy with the white robe and the blue sash and the long black hair and the nice manicured beard, what if that's actually the Antichrist? And when that man shows up, people are going to go, oh, Jesus has returned, Jesus has returned. The Bible says that he's going to sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now who could pull that off but Jesus Christ? You know, a lot of these people try to say that the Antichrist is actually symbolically the Roman Catholic Church. That's absurd. Totally absurd. The, the, the Roman Catholic Church, first of all, they don't have the worship of the whole world. Secondly, how can you call the Roman Catholic Church the man of sin, the son of perdition? No, don't be ridiculous. The Antichrist is going to be a man, and I don't believe he's going to be some blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy that looks good. I think he's going to be this Christ figure that many people believe is Jesus Christ. And, of course, what do the majority of people believe right now about Jesus? They believe he's going to return to bring peace on the earth. They seem to forget the, the guy in Revelation chapter 19, you know, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, 
Jesus Christ that he comes back to the earth to bring war. Somehow they seem to miss that. And uh, by the way, interesting thing here. Why are people being slain for the word of God in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, after the Antichrist is revealed? It's kind of an interesting thing there, isn't it? Uh, another interesting thing is, a little while ago, a couple years back, I guess now, the Hollywood movie, The Book of Eli, came out, and it was about a man who has the very last King James Bible. And he's walking from east to west. He doesn't have the desire of women. There's definitely a lot of Antichrist symbolism in there. But this story was about this man, and, and in the movie... At one point, I saw it, and I'm not recommending it, I'm not endorsing it, but in the movie at one point, he says, she says, you know, tell me what happened. You know, this girl that's with him and everything, and, and he says, well, he said there was a there was an event, and it ripped a hole in the sky, and this Bible was blamed. And they gathered up all these Bibles, and they burned them. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Was Hollywood kind of giving a little bit of a prophecy about what's going to come? on this earth oh they wouldn't do a thing like that now would they <coughs> now it's interesting too because if the rapture does happen in 2012 and I'm not you know I'm not setting a date uh, I don't know uh, but if it would happen in here in 2012 what would they think they'd think about well, was the end of the world it was what the Mayan calendar prophesied and then this Christ guy shows up this Antichrist and they're going to think Jesus came back to bring peace to the earth. It's the millennial kingdom. Yay. <laughs> See, this stuff could all line up. Now, what if the rapture doesn't happen in 2012? Well, then I'll look for him in 2013. I'm hoping the rapture does happen soon. I'm getting kind of anxious to go to be with the Lord. But let me just say again, I'm not setting a date for the rapture. I'm not saying it will happen in 2012. I just proposed it as a theory. And in conclusion, I just want to say, the main question is, are you saved? Are you sure you are saved? If not, you better be sure. Okay, watch our salvation message. Contact me if you need more information. Man, make sure you are saved. You want to go at the pre-tribulation rapture. You do not want to be judged by God as a lost sinner down here without Jesus Christ, the true Jesus of the Bible, by the way, the one that's founded in the pages of the King James Bible, you want to have faith in him because you don't want to be left here to face the wrath of Almighty God. You better make sure that you are his purchased possession. You better make sure that you have a sold tag on you and that tag on it says property of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are saved, you're going up. You say, I believe in a post-trib rapture. Well, I'm real sorry. If you're saved, you're going to go up before the tribulation. You're not going to get to endure to the end and prove how tough you are as a Christian. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. You're going up. So that's going to be it for this study. Again, thank you very much for listening.